Aerial observation is a relatively young art. Its extensive use began during the First World War when balloons became a familiar sight. They were used at that time principally for adjustment of artillery fire, and their operations contributed materially to the effectiveness of those weapons. In the same conflict, airplanes also were widely used to perform observation missions. On flights, which were at that time considered long range, they secured extremely valuable information by bringing back reports and photographs. The present World War finds heavily armored, low-flying pursuit type aircraft performing similar duties close in and fast-flying, long-range, medium and light bombers accomplishing the same type of mission deep in enemy territory. Armed only for defense, they carry complete radio and photographic equipment. They possess an extended radius of operation and depend to a very great extent upon air superiority for successful completion of their mission. For liaison work and close cooperation with the artillery, still another type of airplane is in use, an adaptation of the civilian air flivver. Its extremely slow speed permits it to hover inside of a target and to operate from fields of very small area. This type of airplane is extremely vulnerable to fire of all weapons. It is never employed during daylight over areas occupied by hostile forces. In general, observation missions fall in three classes. The first of these is visual observation, in which the observer reports what he sees. Photographic observation is a second highly important function of this component of the Air Force. The adjustment of artillery fire is the third type of duty performed by observation aviation. But regardless of the mission, every observer has a dual responsibility to observe and report. To fulfill this obligation, he must be highly skilled in many fields. He must have a thorough working knowledge of navigation in order to play his role in taking the aircraft to its objective and returning to its base. He must be expert at map orientation. At all times, he must know exactly where he is in terms of map coordinating. He must be skilled in communication, both radio and visual, and the procedures involved in their use. He must be able to identify what he sees, mechanized vehicles, ground installations, aircraft either on the ground or in flight, and even surface craft. He must be proficient in aerial gunnery, this film is presented to accomplish a dual task, to acquaint student observers with their responsibilities and duties, and to inform the personnel of all arms and services regarding the roles, capabilities, and limitations of observation aviation. To function efficiently, observation aviation must be employed properly. G2 and G3 must assign missions within the realm of its capabilities. The officers who request information with a full working knowledge of observation's limitations will find that this important branch of the flying forces can do an excellent job for them. Let's consider some of these limitations. Fog is one. Obviously, when foggy conditions prevail, aerial observation is seriously handicapped. Occasionally, valuable information can be secured in spite of light ground fog. But when heavy fog blankets the ground, observation is helpless. Similarly, at night, observation operates at a serious disadvantage. Lights of highway traffic can be identified. It is also possible to locate populated areas, cities, towns, and villages, and often airports. But under blackout conditions, these disappear. In bright moonlight, white objects like concrete airport runways can frequently be spotted miles away. Night observation missions can secure some information by the use of parachute flares, but at best, this intelligence is likely to be incomplete and possibly inaccurate. Normally, night missions can be relied upon to yield no more than general information. 
there are other limitations even in daylight under conditions of good visibility. Visual observation cannot detect well-camouflaged installations. Troops and vehicles concealed in dense woods are safe from the observer's eyes as well as his camera. Rough air constitutes another limiting factor. Attempting to observe from an airplane which is tossed about the sky makes location and identification of objects extremely difficult. Here's an example. You probably can see the roadblock in this scene, but can you detect its defenses? Altitude imposes another limitation. Here's a mechanized reconnaissance troop. Can you identify it? Each scout car carries three machine guns. Can you see them? Let's drop lower. You'd be attempting target, but can you see the guns even now? Here's some division artillery on the march. See the guns? Are they medium or light? Few observers could tell even from this altitude. And as a final limitation, the observer cannot supply G2 and G3 with any negative information. For example, he cannot say, there are no troops in these woods. Nor can he say, this road is not being used. He can only say, at the time of the observation, no traffic was seen on the road. The observer must confine himself scrupulously to the facts. Others will interpret and evaluate them. It is not for the observer to state that a unit occupies too large a front. He cannot say, for example, the front line is overextended. He should report the front line extends from this point to this. However, despite these limitations, the observer can supply much vital information of a positive nature. For example, the network of roads which covers every civilized country is one of the most prominent features visible to the observer. Stretching in every direction, they are essential to military operations, and the traffic they bear is vital military information. Truck columns and mechanized units, particularly when evenly or closely spaced, are readily detected by the observer. He can count them accurately, report their direction and approximate speed, and frequently the nature of the vehicles themselves. Such information is of tremendous importance. Vehicles rarely leave visible tracks on roads, but when they start cross country, they leave prominent marks in the field, and these may lead to an assembly point. Most modern military vehicles can travel just off the road in many types of terrain with relatively little loss of speed. In this way, they blend into the terrain and are much less obvious. On dirt roads, especially after a prolonged dry spell, dust will be apparent at great distances. Eventually, most roads lead to bridges. And these spans are of particular interest to intelligence officers. To a certain extent, bridges are the bottlenecks in military operations. If a river is unfordable, all traffic must cross on bridges or by time-consuming ferry operations. Accurate reports on bridge traffic carries a wealth of military information. Railway bridges and the traffic which passes over them tell another story of equal importance. Railroad trains are easy to spot and to identify as passenger or freight. By coordinating these reports with others on activity in train yards, the intelligence officer has priceless information. Extensive installations, such as tent cities and troop concentrations in the rear areas, are also easy to see and identify, even from high altitudes and at great distances. However, encampments nearer the front are less evident because they lack the orderly appearance of permanent or semi-permanent installations and well-concealed pup tent camps may escape the observer entirely. 
Construction work invariably leaves huge scars upon the Earth's surface. Until they can be camouflaged, or nature covers them with grass, they are outstanding features. They can be seen for miles and are a sure sign of construction work in the vicinity. Whenever men, animals, or vehicles move across open country, they leave tracks in the grass. These soon become paths or roads and frequently lead the observer to hidden installations, such as command posts. In many situations and many types of terrain, observation is invaluable for reconnaissance, particularly with mechanized or cavalry units. Bringing his reports back promptly, the observer can transmit his information, which may be in the form of writing, maps, or photographs, by dropping it to the ground troops. Often the information may be of such nature that a conference is desirable. This is readily accomplished by the versatile liaison airplane. Requiring no prepared airdrome for its operation, this small craft can land on almost any straight stretch of level road. Airplanes of this type are extremely vulnerable to the fire of all weapons and should not be risked over hostile territory where the enemy is known or believed to be in force. However, for a liaison between columns moving by different routes and for similar employment, they can perform a service which can be accomplished in no other manner. Remember, the observer has a responsibility to observe and report. Those who assign his missions must know the limitations under which he works. By understanding the other fellow's job, efficient operations are assured. Properly employed, aerial observation is a potent weapon, the eyes of the army. <laughs>